Okay, guys, uh, we've been talking about Chicano muralism, Mexican art, um, themes and ideas, notions, names, and identities. Right. I, Dave, your fearless instructor, really lucked out when I met my wife, who was from Mexico, a television reporter working for Telemundo NBC, because she really opened me up to a lot of new and interesting things. We traveled a lot, went to Guatemala for a couple of weeks, Tula, Cholula, Teotihuacan, um, Cacaxla, all of these sites are in Mexico, aside from Guatemala not being in Mexico, of course. Um, I spent a lot of time in Mexico City looking at the murals there and just all the unbelievable history and things that are of interest in Mexico City. Um, down to Oaxaca, to Mitla, and, you know, it was... It, Rather than just, you know, reading books and doing research and whatever and then, you know, talking to people I knew, it was interesting to, that I could use my wife as a kind of sounding board to talk to her about things because her being Mexican, moving to the United States and living here for 10 years and, you know, she had a very interesting and different perspective and it, 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 was, it was through a, a conversation with her one night that I really began to think about the nature of this class that I was teaching and, and uh, sort of some slightly different ways to to approach it, let's say, um, which led to really the, the essential, let's say, heart of this lecture. So this is a class, if you looked in the, in the Los Angeles Community College Districts database, you would see that this class can be taught or offered at one of our colleges or one of our campuses with one of two titles, or it can be cross-listed with both titles. It's either a history course called Mexican American History, or it's an ethnic studies course called Chicano Studies. It's the same thing with two different names, okay? So the question then might be, well, why does it have two different names, and what's this all about? And Well, if you, if you go back to the 1960s, there were no such things as ethnic studies courses offered at colleges around the country. You certainly didn't have ethnic studies departments, and you didn't have even classes called African American history or Mexican American history, the Asian American history, Jewish American history. These things didn't exist. But the 1960s and the early 70s was a revolutionary period in the history of the country. And during that time, historiography changed a lot. Historiography is a word that means the writing of history, the way that we tell history, the way that we tell the story of history. During the 60s, the way that we wrote history, made sense of history, interpreted history changed dramatically. And out of that time period came ethnic studies classes and at universities and even some community colleges like East LA College, ethnic studies departments. The idea behind all of this was to create a, a, a more well-rounded, a more inclusive and improved, revised story of American history. So when you think of Mexican-American history, the history of Mexican-Americans in the United States, you know, you can think of a lot of things. You can think of important civil rights figures, people fighting for social justice, political change, like Cesar Chavez. You can think about athletes, baseball, football, not too many Latinos in football, but some, but baseball, very big, obviously, soccer, boxers, people like Oscar De La Hoya. You can think of singers, entertainers, pop stars, people like Selena Gomez, or political leaders like the former mayor of Los Angeles, Antonio Villaraigosa, actors and actresses, um, I just threw a blank on her name. For God's sakes, I put her in there. What's her name? Par uh, uh, <laughs> Tony Parker's ex-wife from Desperate Housewives. I'm looking right at her. Oh, my God. Okay, well, here's Artie Moreno, the owner of the Angels baseball team. And he's a big businessman in general as well. He was a multimillionaire before he ever bought the Angels. But he's... <laughs> Terry Hatcher, and anyway, unbelievable. I cannot remember her name, but I can't do this. All right, I'm going to sit here until I figure this out. What's her damn name? 
I could Google it. Well, anyway, you guys know who I'm talking about, right? If not, look up Desperate Housewives. You'll see lots of pictures of her. But okay. Um, so all of these these people that I just showed you some pictures of and, and a million more, you know, famous Mexican-Americans, they can all have, or each of them can have, more than one way of identifying themselves. Like if you just said, hey, what are you? What's the first word that comes to your mind when I say, what are you? What what, what might I say if you stop me in the street and said, dude, look, here's a $100 bill. First thing that comes to your mind, what are you? I don't know. I'm, I might say human. I could say an American. Eva Longoria. <laughs> no, I wouldn't say that about myself. That's her name. Good Lord. Embarrassing. Okay. I might say an American. I might say human. I might say an Angelino. I'm very proud of Los Angeles. I might say a Californian. I might say a history instructor or just teacher. I might say a rare book dealer because I own a book business and I do that as well. There's a lot of different ways that you can identify yourselves. But Latinos or Hispanics or well, there, there's a lot of different names that are used, can be used rightly, wrongly uh, to identify these people that are the, the subject of our course, which is Mexican-Americans, right? Mexican-American history, the history of the Mexican and the history, or pardon me, the Mexican and the history of the United States. So let's go with the first word, Mexican, okay, as an adjective of or pertaining to Mexico and its people, of or pertaining to Spanish as used in Mexico, in other words, the Mexican version of Spanish, of or pertaining to the Nahuatl language and its speakers, Nahuatl was the language of the Aztecs and a whole lot of other people besides down in central Mexico, still spoken today by millions of Mexicans. Um, my wife's nanny, uh, when she was a, a baby, uh, was this woman named Carmelita, who only spoke Nahuatl when she came to work for their family. And over time, she learned Spanish. And, and, and my wife, when she was a little kid, started going to school. She taught her how to read and write. Fascinating story. But at any rate, noun. A Mexican is a native or inhabitant of Mexico. Okay, so if you were born, meaning native, if you were born in Mexico, no matter where else you go in the world, you could call yourself a Mexican. If you live in Mexico, whether or not you were born there, you might call yourself a Mexican. Okay, what about Mexican-American? Well, as an adjective of or pertaining to Mexican-Americans or their culture. See Chicano later. As a noun, a citizen or resident of the United States of Mexican birth or descent. Chicano, we'll get to that later. Okay, so if you're a U.S. citizen or you're a resident in this country and you were born in Mexico or like one or both of your parents were born in Mexico, you might call yourself a Mexican-American. All right, next, mestizo. This is a word that comes from Latin, mestizias, okay, mestizias from mixed or mongrel. It was a way that the Romans and people within the Roman Empire described anyone whose parents and or grandparents were from different races or ethnicities, right? If you, some, one of your parents was from North Africa and one of your parents was from Greece, you would be a mestizo. If one of your parents was from England and one of your parents was from France, both areas that were controlled by Rome, part of the Roman Empire, you would be a mestizo. Okay. Now, nowadays, a person whose mother's English, father's French, they just say, you know, I'm half English, half French, my, my, and explain it. They wouldn't use the word mestizo because mestizo, as a noun, has really come to be identified with Spanish America. Not just Mexico, but Cuba, Chile, Argentina, Peru, Colombia, etc. But okay, a noun. A person of racially mixed ancestry could be ethnically mixed as well, but this is the dictionary definition. I used one particular dictionary. A person of racially mixed ancestry, especially in Latin America, of mixed indigenous and European, usually Spanish or Portuguese, ancestry, or in the Philippines, of mixed indigenous and foreign 
blood got cut off there, or ancestry should be there, but it got cut off at the bottom. Okay, now you might say Philippines. What about the Philippines? Well, Philip II, King of Spain, Emperor of the Spanish Empire, was the guy running the show back in the 1500s when the Philippines were conquered by Spain. So those islands were named after the king and the emperor. And in those islands, they spoke, still do speak, a lot of people, Spanish. And so those folks, as well, historically have been referred to as mestizos within the last 500 years. Okay, next, Hispanic. Now it starts getting fun. Another word from Latin, Hispanicus, meaning from Hispanica, Spain. Okay, that's what the Romans called the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal now. They called it Hispanica. So if you're from that part of the world in the time of the Roman Empire, they say, oh, you're a Hispanic, or you're Hispanicus, that's what they would have said. Okay, now, as an adjective in the modern world, of or relating to Spain or Spanish-speaking countries, especially those of Latin America, noun, a Spanish-speaking person living in the United States, especially one of Latin American descent. Okay, now this is a slightly flawed definition, even though it comes out of an official dictionary, because Latin America also includes Brazil. In Brazil, they're of Portuguese descent. They don't speak Spanish, they speak Portuguese. So that really, it's off. It doesn't really apply. Okay, stick to that first one, all right, and partially to the second one, and you're going to understand Hispanic. Hispanic is a slightly controversial term nowadays because it was created, not created, in the modern era, in the 20th century. The reason we use Hispanic is because the United States government, back in the 1940s, was trying to come up with a word that they could use on the census form for people who were white, but not white-skinned white. In other words, of European descent, but darker-skinned. In other words, they were trying to figure out how to categorize Mexican-Americans and Puerto Rican-Americans, Cuban-Americans. Well, they came up with Hispanic because from their point of view, it meant to be like the Spanish. People that are like the Spanish, well, if they speak Spanish and they're from places where Spain used to be in charge, they're like the Spanish, Hispanic. And that word didn't bother anybody for a long time. But then in the 1960s, or pardon me, in the 1980s, a lot of Hispanics started saying, we don't want to be called Hispanic, man, because the Spaniards were conquerors. The Spaniards were the conquistadors. The Spaniards came to the Americas, and they destroyed the, the civilizations, the cultures of the indigenous peoples. They, they killed and raped Aztecs and Maya. And nah, we don't want to be associated with conquistadors, murderers, rapists, genocidists. No. Well, what do you want to be called? We need a group term, a demographic term that will sort of represent all of you. We want to be Latinos. Oh, Latinos? You said, yeah, Latinos. Okay, well, that's also from Latin. Duh, right? That means like the Romans, okay? Now, adjective. In North America, a person of Latin American origin or descent, especially a boy or a man. Remember, Latin American also means Brazil. But that's okay, because the Portuguese colonized Brazil. The Spaniards colonized all those areas of Spanish America. The Portuguese, or Portuguese as a language and Spanish as a language, both came from Latin. When the Roman Empire fell apart, all these distant areas of the empire, over years, decades, and centuries, their languages drifted and shifted. So today, in the modern world, there are five, five? Yeah, there are five languages spoken that are all ultimately from Latin, okay? And those are Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and Romanian all derived from Latin. So here with Latino, a person of Latin American origin is sent, that's fine. Brazilians are Latinos. They're like the Romans in a way, right? And Spanish Americans too. That one works. Okay. Second adjective relating to Latinos. Okay. What about noun? 
a person of Latin American origin or descent. I like it. This is good too. But guess what? This also became problematic for people. Okay, in the 90s, about 10 years after the Hispanic uproar, Latinos started becoming problematic to some people. Why? What's wrong with Latin? What the Romans? The Romans were the original <clears throat> no good imperialist culture destroying, war making, conquering, raping, pillaging. We don't want to be like the Romans. They don't want to be like the Romans either. This particular subset of Hispanics or Latinos. Uh, what? Who? What? Well, what do we call you? Well, we don't know. But we don't like that, and we're just letting you know, right? So. The question is, are the two terms here interchangeable? For all intents and purposes and popular usage, yes. But I'll tell you something. If you pay attention to the news, television news, internet news, written news, newspapers, okay, the internet, this is what you're going to discover. If the article or the news story or the conversation or whatever has to do with politics, economics, the business of government, legislation being passed, that kind of stuff, the term that's used is almost always Hispanic. Again, because it's that older formal governmental term, you know, from the census. But uh, let me think about this for a minute. John Carlos Stanton, baseball player, he's a Latino baseball player. Jacil Puig is a Latino baseball player. Jennifer Lopez is a Latino pop star. Uh, Andy Garcia or Michael Pena, they are Latino actors. Latino is usually used for soft news stories, dialogues, and etc. Entertainment, sports, that sort of thing. Okay, they're more or less interchangeable, but they've each had their controversies at different points in time, and they do not technically mean the same things. But again, nowadays, one or the other, one prefers this, the other prefers that. Okay, so what are you? Are you a Mexican, a Mexican-American? Are you a mestizo, Hispanic, a Latino? Well, well, you could be any number of these things all at the same time, right? But how do you identify yourself? How do people identify themselves? doesn't matter what other people call you. It's what you think of yourself. It's who you are with it. It's, who, it's, it's how you identify you, the you -ness of you. I don't know if you -ness is a word, but I like it. Okay, well, let's get to our last term here that we need to make some sense of. And that term is Chicano. Okay, this is a noun. <clears throat> a Mexican-American. So these terms are interchangeable, the dictionary says. Mexican-American and Chicano are synonyms. That is not correct. That is not accurate. That is a misguided, uninformed, non-Latino way of looking at it. I don't want to say a white person's way of looking at it because I think it's anybody that's not a Latino might see it that way. Might. Because back in the early, in the 70s, they were kind of synonymous to a lot of people particularly non-Latinos, okay? But really, a Chicano is a Mexican-American, okay, a resident of the United States, either born here to Mexican parents or of Mexican descent. It's a Mexican-American who is socially and politi politically conscious, who's aware, who's thinking about things, who has an intellectual frame of mind, meaning they're, they're listening to the news, they're reading the news, they're paying attention to current events, they're interested in perhaps changing things for the better, working on improving the system. They're not just all about me, me, me. That, there's no Chicano identity if you're just completely individualistic, egocentric, and self-absorbed. Chicanismo is to is to work for change, to commit yourself to trying to improve things and to being open minded and looking around you, reading between the lines. Okay. Our second definition here, of or pertaining to Mexican Americans or their culture. Well that goes along with number one and being not entirely accurate, as I would hope you'd understand by this point. But now at the very bottom, let's look at this word. Okay, what is the etymology 
etymology. It means where did the word come from? Okay, what is the etymology of Chicano? Okay, well, once upon a time, the Spaniards defeated the Aztec Empire. The Aztecs had an older name for themselves. Their original name for themselves was the Mexica. Mexica. When Mexico was born, an independent nation in 1821, done with colonialism, kicked out the Spanish government and so on and so forth, just like we did to the British, right? The War for Independence, the American Revolution, they had the same thing in Mexico. 1810 to 18, 1821, the Mexican War for Independence, okay? Or the War for Independence against the Spanish Empire, call it whatever you want. They said, what are we going to call our new country? We're going to name it after the Mexica, the, the ancient empire that was here. And, yeah, so we're going to be Mexico. Mexico, Mexico. See, in Nahuatl, X is but in European languages, including Spanish, X is X, right? So very soon, Mexico became Mexico. Mexico. I'm a Mexican, not a Mexican. Okay, so look down there. We've got Mexicano, right? The new country, what are we going to call it? Mexico or Mexico. See, it's even hard for me to remember to accent it that way. Mexico. And we'll all be Mexicans or Mexicanos. Okay, Mexicano. Now, as, as Mexico consolidated its power northward into places like, I'm going to give you the modern names, Texas in particular, New Mexico, Arizona, California, but particularly in Texas, Two different identities began to emerge. The very far northern Mexicans were different than the ones that lived down in the center part of what is now the country of Mexico. And after the Mexican-American War, when the United States conquered and took Texas and Arizona and New Mexico and California and a bunch of other land besides, but let's just consider those border states, a line was drawn, right, between these Mexicans and those Mexicans who were now in the United States. The Mexicans to the south of the border began to think of and refer to and speak of the Mexicans north of the border as not real Mexicanos, not real Mexicanos. They're sort of like halfway Mexicanos, like Hicanos or Chicanos, 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 Chicano. That's where Chicano came from. It was a negative term. It wasn't like the N-word. Okay, it wasn't that harsh. But it was, it was kind of a put-down. It, it was a pejorative. In the 20th century, the phrase Tio Taco was coined. Uncle Taco. Uncle Taco. Maybe you guys have heard of Uncle Tom's Cabin. Famous book from the mid-1800s. You can look it up. I can't have time to go into it here. If you've never heard of it, I would think you have by now. But what does it mean when you call an African-American, a black person, an Uncle Tom? You're saying, this guy's kind of black guy that wants to be like a white person. He wants to be a white person, always trying to kiss up to white people and act more white and walk white, talk white. Right? You're not really black. You're just kind of black because you're an Uncle Tom. Well, you're not really down with the Mexicano vibe essay, right? You know, you're just some Chicano, a Tio Taco. Tio Taco, man. Bendejo, right? Okay, it's a put down. Now, you might be asking yourself, so then why is it that this thing, the Chicano movement, came into being? Why did all these people call themselves Chicanos if this was a put down? Well, a name is whatever you want it to be, okay? I mean, look, guys, we've all seen a million movies, listened to rap songs, et cetera, so on, and walked around the streets of L.A. and other parts of the country and the world and heard black people call each other nigger right? But playfully and in fun and joking around and just saying, you know, nigger please or whatever, right? Wu-Tang Clown. Yeah, okay. They're making that word at that moment into what they want it to be. Not a harsh piece of racial invective, but turning that inside out, possessing it, and at least for the moment, in that moment, redefining it. 
for the purpose of that one comment, this one conversation. Okay, well, that's a Chicano. Bunch of young, fired-up Mexican-Americans in the late 60s and the early 70s who said, hey, we're, we're Chicanos. And their parents and grandparents went, ah, what are you talking about? They said, come on, moms and pops, chill out, right? Abuelito, abuela, come on. It's okay, man. We're Chicanos. We're taking that word. We're making it into our own word. They want it to be a bad word. People want it to be some sort of pejorative and negative thing. No, man, we're making it into a positive thing. That, guys, is where the term Chicano and the Chicano movement and the, the reason that name is what it is. That's where it came from. So, okay. Nomenclature. The subtitle of this lecture is Nomenclature and Identity. Nomenclature means the devising of names for things, choosing names for things, right? So nomenclature and identity. What name do you choose or devise for yourself to put a label or a brand on your identity? Well, in order to make even more sense of this to me, you know, you've got to go all the way back to the beginning, the very beginning, way back, okay? And that means going back to the earliest days of the ancient advanced cultures and civilizations of Mesoamerica. Okay, we're going to talk about this stuff in length in a whole other lecture, but very quickly here. we got to begin with the Olmec, because they were the original, the Ur culture. U-R-Ur culture means beginning culture, genesis culture, first culture, foundational culture. They were the first culture, the Ur culture of Mesoamerica. They came before everybody else. They built the first pyramids. They carved the first great big stone monuments. They may have had writing, they had calendar systems, some things. We don't know about the Olmecs, okay? But they came first, the Olmec or the Olmeca. Okay, then came the Maya. It's not Mayan. That's a misnomer, okay? The people are the Maya, the language is Mayan, okay? But the people are Maya. That, that guy, he's a Maya. Hey, where are you from? What's your family background? Oh, I'm, I'm Maya, okay? So the Maya came after the Olmec, created a far more advanced, far more sophisticated, far more fascinating culture. Again, we're going to talk more about them later, okay? These are just some images from the Maya, all right? Next, the Teotihuacanos. Here you have the mighty Pyramid of the Sun, and a little inset detail from the Pyramid of Quetzalcoatl, the Feathered Serpent. I've been on top of that thing, guys. I've climbed up there, been there, done that. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, the Pyramid of the Sun. Teotihuacan, incredible. The Aztecs called it the meeting place of the gods. Okay, this is Tula. Not very much remains of the old capital of the Toltecs, but this remains. We'll talk about it more. This is Monte Alban, down in Oaxaca, the heartland of the Zapotec culture, the Zapotec civilization. Okay, And then we come to the Aztecs. Going to talk a lot about them, super lot about them. I'm just showing you some images here. Ruins, artistic images, artifacts, paintings, you know, just some things just to give you some flavor. Fabulous, fabulous piece of painting, not a mural by Jorge Gonzalez Camarena, who is primarily a muralist, but this is called El Abrazo, or the embrace, the hug. This Aztec eagle warrior leaping down upon this Spanish conquistador, taking him off his horse, and both of them killing each other, right? Just unbelievable image. <clears throat> Excuse me, we're almost done here, guys. Just a couple more things. So what is it that we know about these ancient... Mesoamerican people. So I don't know what you know, but I know a few things. I know that they were heavyweight electronics consumers, obviously, because here is a fries in Phoenix, Arizona, that is completely dedicated to the whole Mesoamerican vibe in terms of its like decorative motif. I'm sure if you guys have ever been in a fries, you've noticed that it's decorated in some peculiar way. Each store has its own theme. In Phoenix, Arizona, it's a Mesoamerican theme. Right? I mean, dig this completely crazy. These the worst mannequins ever. I'm sorry, the image is not really crisp, but just these terrible like <laughs> outfits. It's really horrible, but okay. Electronics consumers, right? And clearly the Aztecs were into long-distance trekking. Right? It's right there, Aslan, right? 
and grocery supply. La Curacao, yeah, big in that. That's huge industry for them. Also, financial advice, investments, the whole interior of Aztec Financial here, which is located in Burbank, California, got all these murals. You can't, I've never been there when they were open. They've always been closed when I'm there. So I just have to shoot through the window like this, and I would love to go inside. There's murals all the way back and around the whole perimeter of the office, but someday maybe. But okay. Also, into the medical profession, as well as pallet supply, housing developments, liquor stores, of course, cheese, shoe repair, right? You got to get your zapatos fixed somewhere. Why not buy a Mayan? And of course, food trucks. And let us not forget organized athletics, right? The Aztecs were big into baseball, big into basketball, and big into football, okay? Now, obviously, I'm not saying any of this with a straight face, okay? I just think that it's interesting the way that smart businessmen looking for that Latino buck have used the iconography and the names and the identity of ancient Mesoamerican peoples to to brand themselves to try to make a better living, right? And of course the debate about naming American athletic organizations after Indians, the Cleveland Indians, the the Washington Redskins, the Atlanta Braves, I mean if you pay it all atten any kind of attention to sports and or the news in general. This is a debate that's been going on for a couple of decades now. We'll have to wait and see how it shakes out, but it's interesting. Now, the one last thing that I want to talk about is language. Okay. In order to really get some sense out of or try to make sense of a culture, a people, their history, you need to come to some kind of understanding with their language. And that doesn't mean you need to be able to speak their language or read every three to paragraph or page. It just means to at least approach their language on a level to where you're willing to try to pronounce things properly and think about the way that their language works a little bit. And if you just, if you're reading history text and it's about some other part of the world and the words are not English or whatever your native language is, you just kind of gloss over them or you just kind of recognize them with your eye. You're not really doing anything for yourself, and you're certainly not giving those people or the language or culture the respect that they deserve. So, for just a couple, of, like five minutes, and we're going to be done. I want to give you guys, guys a little bit of an introduction to the Nahuatl language, because for the first half of this course, you're going to need it. Okay, literally, the first half of the course, two months basically, we're talking Aztecs and Mayans and etc. And although this is not the language of the Mayans, Primarily, we're going to be talking about the Aztecs and their part of Mexico. So, Nahuatl, lots of Nahuatl words, guys, dozens of them. Okay, so let's just go over this really quickly here. A great deal of the terminology of the early part of this course is from Nahuatl, the language of the Mexica or Aztecs, and the dominant language of Mesoamerica at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards in the early 1500s. Much of Nahuatl may be read or pronounced as if it were Spanish. For example, que is que, and que is key, while qui rhymes with qui. The accent or emphasis is nearly always, not every time, but close, placed on the next to last syllable of a word. Thus, Mexica, or Guatemoc, or Tenochtitlan. Exceptions are Chapultepec, and words that end with the half-enunciated TL, like Popocatapetl. Or Quetzalcoatl. When TL is involved, there's no uniform rule. The accent is in any number of places. Okay. There are other peculiarities for the non-native or non-Mesoamerican, such as X, which I went over earlier. It's sh. Okay, like in English, like sh in English, S H. While Z sounds like an S. H U who is W, and H U E is we. Okay, wa and we, not who and hue. Double L within a word does not sound like the Spanish Y, but like the English double L of call. So, gali is gali. TL as a suffix at the end of a word has a soft glottal sound with the T softened and the L barely heard at all, as in Quetzalcoatl. Okay, Quetzalcoatl or Nahuatl. Nahuatl.
just play along with me. It's like Rumper Room when you were a kid, right? Okay. Also, and not what the component of the word to the right is always a subject, i.e. Quetzalcoatl derives from Quetzali, or precious, and Coatl, or serpent. Precious serpent. Precious snake. Tonantzin derives from To, or our, Nan, or mother, and Zin, as a, as a suffix, indicates an honorific, or our beloved mother. Tonantzin, a goddess. The name means our beloved mother. Some other examples of pronunciation with accented or emphasized syllables and capital letters are Ehekatl, Quetzpalin, Tamawanchon, Siwatl, Okichtli, Tlaxcalis, Huehuetlactole. That's a good one. Huehuetlactole. It's an ancient word. That's what that means. An old word, an ancient word, a word of power. Nahuatl words that were adopted by the Spanish. Chiquito, Megate, Elote, Guajalote, Jocoque, Jante, and Chichis. And then words that were slightly tweaked from Nahuatl to become Spanish and then Mexican Spanish words. Chocolatl, Tomatl, Aguacatl, <coughs> Guatemalan. Yucatan. Okay, that's the best one. When the Spaniards got to the Yucatan Peninsula, and I say Yucatan because I'm used to it, Yucatan, they said, hey, what do you call this place? And the Indians said, we don't know what you're saying. What they said was, Yucatan, we don't know what you're saying. And the Spaniards went, oh, Yucatan, okay, Yucatan, well, we got it right. <laughs> okay, now, again, just some basics, just to give you a sense of how this stuff works. You're going to encounter a lot of words in the next six, seven, eight weeks um, from Nahuatl. And, you know, I can't make you do anything at home. But if you're reading along with order, you know, say them out loud. Roll them around in your mouth. Try to come to some kind of a, an understanding with these words. It, it really, you'd be surprised how much it helps your, the cognitive process in, in learning the material and things in general. I'm going to take you back really quickly here just to show you something. These images throughout this whole thing is this fantastic mural down in Chiapas in southern Mexico where the Mayans were big stuff. So there's this big, like, really phantasmagoric sort of mural of the cosmology of the Mayans. And this is like the far left, and then you go along towards the right and just kind of look at it. Very, very, very groovy. Oh, such an amazing mural. Yeah. Not as crisp as I might like at some moments, but okay, anyway, guys, look, this is the end of the first lecture in the course. If you're digging the scene, if you think you're going to be able to put up with me, this is my vibe. This is the way I approach things. This is what you're going to get another six or eight times throughout the semester, or eight, maybe even ten video lectures. Um, you know, it's up to you, okay? Hopefully, you're going to stick around, and I'll see you next time, okay? So thanks so much for being here, and uh, something. All right, bye.